Pokes with the come from behind victory over Texas this weekend to secure that homecoming win back in the win column, six and one on the season, top 10, all is right in the world. Welcome to another episode of the Believe in OK State podcast. I am Megan Robinson, joined once again by Justin Southwell and Eve Batoba, the new dad. Congrats, Eve. Hey, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yes, it's been a hectic past couple of days, but we're here, baby. We're here. Well, we're glad to have you back. And also, Justin, congratulations to you for correctly predicting the Cowboys uniforms last week. How about that? Yes. Come on, South. Hey, it looked pretty good. And I should have known they would go all orange for homecoming against Texas because they're in all white. But yeah. hey, I got the helmet, so tip my cap to myself, which also it's only right too. Like, yeah, it, like I'm I'm wearing it. <laughs> it's a it's it's a battle of the oranges, right? It's only right that it's you know America's brightest orange versus burnt orange, and I'm glad that the brightness wins this time. Yeah, I think Oklahoma State's official Twitter tweeted "bright over burnt." So there Gotta you love go. It. There you go. Bright, bright is better, guys. As I said, come from behind victory over Texas. It was a, a little a little touch and go there for a while. But what did you guys learn about mm-hmm. Oklahoma State this weekend and and this team that we have here? Justin, we'll you know, start with you. Yeah, I was going to say, so these guys, it's very similar to what we've seen over the past couple of weeks. It looks like they like to play from behind almost because they get a chance to open up the offense and they get to throw down the field and they get to make plays, kind of spread it out instead of holding on to a lead and getting a little bit more conservative. And, you know, not that they want to get down by too much, but whenever you're down by a couple of scores, They're not scared. And so I think we learned that about Oklahoma State this week. It doesn't matter how much we're going to get down by. We're going to make it a game in the end. Yeah. What did I learn about Oklahoma State this week? Look, they told me that OK State was overrated because they lost to an undefeated top 10 team on the road in TCU. Okay, I heard someone say, matter of fact, I heard somebody say that with their starting QB, Texas is a top five team in the country. But what does it say about the Cowboys after they beat that quote unquote top five team? Oh, and that's with the offensive player of the week. Oh, 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 and that's with the defensive player of the week. Oh, by the way, who's a Jim Thorpe Award finalist? Oh, that's also with a kicker who's probably going to be a Lou Gorza Award finalist. No, no, no. Oh, but this defense, they give up too many points on this defense. It's the Big 12 Conference, boy. Everybody gives up yards on defense. Oh, by the way, in 2022, everybody has excellent offenses. So our defense, we make big plays in big moments and we force the team to the other team to have turnovers all right so last week i'm minding my own business and someone sends me a random clip of lindell white on his podcast saying that oklahoma state is overrated so i just say look in the words of dj Khaled, it breaks my heart all right they don't believe in us but you know what the pokes just keep on battling and look there's still room on the bandwagon so go ahead and join cowboy nation and believe in ok state that's how i feel about it Tell them why you mad, Eve. Tell them why you mad. I'm trying to recruit my Patriot fan friends because we're having a rough season. So I'm like, hey, if you want to cheer for a winner, guys, we got one here in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And you mentioned Texas, a top five team with uh, Quinn, Quinn Ewers. Um, well, that that top five worthy quarterback went 19 for 49 with two mm. touchdowns and three interceptions against our mediocre Oklahoma State defense also another fun stat of the game my my favorite stat we won the penalty battle with zero for the first time in program history we are currently we have zero turnovers and we're currently ranked first in fbs for the fewest penalties this season if you walk anywhere through the facility through the boom picking stadium in the tunnels you see dat discipline and toughness guys how do you think this that mentality is helping the players be so disciplined on the field Yeah, I think nothing exemplifies that more than zero penalties in a football game, right? I know a couple of them got called off, a couple of them offset each other. But I mean, with that being said, like how rare is it that you ever see something like that? I know that personally in my life, I've never seen zero penalties in a football game. So I think it goes to show just how great uh, of a coaching job Coach Gundy has done. I mean, for a team to be able to do that, they must have a great head coach, right? They must have a coach who's going to go down to be a Hall of Fame head coach one day, right? And I'm saying that, yeah, I think so. But um, that discipline and toughness, um, I mean, that, that that speaks for everything, especially whenever your team had a bunch of players that didn't even play against, you know, if we're being honest, a roster that is much more talented than they are. 
So that was a complete difference maker right there. And I think that discipline and tough football will win you a lot of football games. And Justin, we watched the game together. I came over and I crashed your family's tailgate. So thank you again for that. But you were telling me a little bit about Gundy's philosophy about giving up yardage. I remember we were watching and I was like, wait, zero penalties to 13. And this was still with a couple minutes left in the game. So can you explain to our listeners what Gundy's philosophy is when it comes to giving up yardage? In games. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's something he learned, I think, actually from Coach Snyder at Kansas State. It's the the hidden yards is kind of what I think it's being dubbed as now. And really that comes down to penalties and yardage that you can pick up on special teams. Yeah. And whether that's kick return yards or punt return yards, if you are doing well at those things, you're going to be starting at a better field position on average than your opponent. And whenever you add that up, it's called hitting yards. They're obviously still there in the stat sheet. It's just a little bit harder to find. But whenever you're adding that up and, and punting too, right? So Tom Hutton, how valuable is he that he's able to down punts in the 10 and five yard line backing the opponents up? Yeah. And you're seeing these hidden yards added up with special teams. Not so much maybe this game, but you definitely saw it with the penalties, right? 114 or 119 yards, was it? 14 I mean, penalties that's the for 119 of, yards, yeah. Right, yeah, The link over the length of the entire football field. And so it doesn't always necessarily add up to, well, you know, we got seven more points because there's other factors at play. Um, and, and Gundy has kind of said with a caveat, you consider these things as long as your turnover margin isn't like, you know, completely crazy where you're giving up four or five penalties because at that point you're just kind of throwing, throwing the game away. But whenever you're disciplined enough, to win the battle for these hidden yards, a lot of the time, that's going to be the difference in the game. And I think we saw that this last Saturday. Yeah. And Justin, I would say that's the game within the game. I don't think anybody knows how to manipulate the rule book better than Coach Gundy does. I think we see it at least once every other week where he forces the other team to have a delay of game penalty or or they have to burn a timeout due to them not understanding the substitution rules. Right. Like Gundy has mastered that and he's been doing it really since 2012. I think I remember like that's when he really started, you know, taking advantage of that rule. But it's it's those hidden yards where, you know, they say men lie, women lie, numbers don't lie. A lot of times those numbers do lie uh, because those those yardage, uh, that yardage is hidden, as Justin mentioned. Someone was telling me once, and I don't, you guys have been in the locker room with Gundy, so you can tell me if this is completely ridiculous and not true at all. But along the lines of playing the system and the rules and stuff, like he also likes to find advantages. So like if you go, you know, if we're traveling, West Virginia is coming here this year, but let's say we travel to West Virginia for a game we did last year, you know, that's a, a time change. So that hour, like we need to adjust our players sleep so that they can get X number of hours of sleep because every like hour less is, you know, that could take one yard off a run if they're tired or something to that effect. Is that, does that make any sense to, am I talking crazy? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I know I, I know that coaches do all kinds of things. I remember there was one year in Thanksgiving where he was telling us basically, I think he told the training table staff not to prepare any turkey because there was something within the, the turkey that caused, I forget the word, I don't Makes know. Makes you tired. Yeah, yeah. So he was like, hey, we're not going to have the turkey because we don't want this to, you know, roll over into game day, whoever we were playing that week. Um, so different things like that. I remember there was a, in a way, I'm not going to say which coach, but there was a coach that we were facing one year and I was talking to the hotel staff and they were telling me that, yeah, I mean, they use this hotel every single year. And in certain rooms, they'll put like different bugs, like different crickets and things like that for the opposing team. And I'm like, what? Like, so yeah, coaches do all kinds of things. But uh, I know that Gundy is extremely strategic that way. Yeah, and um, I think back whenever we were playing, the big thing was our 11 a.m. games, 11 a.m. kickoffs. We were jazzed up and ready to go, whereas some of the other teams, it was kind of like, you know, groggy, uh, took a little bit to get going, and we played to that as, a, as an advantage too. Um, I don't know how much he, he necessarily adjusted the practice based on that to get us prepared, but uh, it was just a matter of everybody on the team really buying in and no matter how quirky something may sound or how, you know, how ridiculous it may sound at the time, any kind of advantage that you might be able to, to exploit from the other team, go ahead and why not try it out? Yeah. 
moving on to around the big 12 and other things. I'm sure, I mean, I could, I could spend all day talking about coach tactics and advantages and stuff, <laughs> but you know, we got to We got to keep it moving. Um, Baylor hands, Kansas, their third straight loss this season, 35, 23, Texas tech steam rolls, West Virginia, 48, 10, not, not the most exciting game in the big 12, but the exception of, I'd say the first half, half and first half of the third quarter, the TCU K state game was pretty good, but TCU ultimately overcame an 18 point deficit to win that game. Do you guys think that TCU can run the table and make it to the big 12 championship undefeated? Go ahead, Justin. <laughs> you have thoughts, I can tell. Oh, no, I was just trying to punt to Eve. Do I think they can? Probably not. But do I want them to? Absolutely, I do. I um, I want them to go undefeated. I want to meet them in the Big 12 title game that they are ranked the highest and that we knock them off and give us the best chance to get into the college football playoff. Will they? It's tough to say. Um, I know that... A lot of the teams that they played already, uh, I think they've beaten four ranked opponents in a row. So I think that maybe that will ease up a little bit for them as the schedule kind of progresses. But um, yeah, we'll see. I know that they do have a game in Austin. Um, Texas, you know, just because we beat them doesn't mean they're, yeah. you know, a slouch. So um they, I think that TCU had the advantage of playing some of the tougher opponents at home. So I'm interested to see how they hold up on the road. Yeah. Any given Saturday, you just never know how a team is going to show up. But I like TCU and I'm going to hype up TCU as much as I possibly can. I mean, hey, TCU is the best team in the country right now. Yeah, I'm going to say all the good things about TCU. <laughs> Because I hope yeah. we play them again in the Big 12 Conference Championship game and get the revenge that we need. And it'll be actually pretty reminiscent of what happened last year when we met Baylor again in the Big 12 title game. That's that's exactly what I'm ho hoping for. So, yes, TCU can run the table. TCU as, is as talented as everybody says. TCU is the best team in the Big 12 Conference, guys. And, uh, yeah, whenever we play them again, it'll it'll be fun. I'm looking at their schedule right now and they play at West Virginia home versus tech at Texas at Baylor and their season home versus Iowa state. So I'd say the two big uh, asterisks or whatever you want to call it are Texas and Austin and Baylor, because I, you know, those Baylor, we, we played Baylor kind of close. I think they've kind of fallen apart in recent weeks, but again, playing in Waco, I wouldn't sleep on anybody in the Big 12. So, but I'm with you guys. I I hope they win. Also, this week, uh, they faced a Adrian Martinez list, um, Kansas, Kansas State. State. So, I mean, how much can we really gauge this game? I mean, you do have to give them credit. They overcame a double digit deficit for the second week in a row, but they're also facing a backup quarterback who then was out for a series and then came back in. So it's like, how do you guys genuinely feel that they're the, do you think, but do you think with an Adrian Martinez, I guess if Adrian Martinez had stayed in that game, that would have been a different game. I, I don't know how much different it would have been uh, because Will Howard is the backup for Kansas state and he's been there for a while too. And actually I think he started off completing I think it was around like eight for 10 or something like that before he kind of yeah. ultimately fell off. And so they kind of kept Kansas. He kept Kansas state in the game. Um, he's also a good runner. I think I saw that he had um, a, a rushing touchdown in that game too. And um, obviously you want to see, you know, your, your stud Adrian Martinez in the game, but Will Howard, and, and you see it all the time, really <laughs> the backup comes in and it's not a surefire thing that, you know, you don't, you haven't really seen as much film on him, and you don't really know the tendencies of of how it's going to play out. But yeah, um, yeah I, I you got to give TCU credit for that uh, comeback again. You know, like I said, those guys are the epitome of resilient. They're going to find a way to win. It sounds like and uh, the best team in the country. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very similar to our game, right? We were up by seventeen. I think uh, Kansas State was up by eighteen. Same thing at TCU. Um, so it kind of played out similarly. Um, except they did it, like you said, against their backup. And, uh, you know, we had Spencer the whole time. So 
I'll be at hurt. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it, it always comes down to how big of a drop off there is between the first string and the second string, right? Like having worked in the NFL, like there is a huge discrepancy and a huge difference between the starter and the second string player. Oftentimes in college, you know, depending on who the player is, you know, maybe there's a slight drop off, but typically the the, the scheme and the people around um, can actually make up for it. So I think those are the, the those are the things that I look for, especially whenever it comes to different matchups and mismatches that the coaches can dial up. Um, I do believe that in college it is so much uh, about what kind of scheme the the coach is running and is uh, is the opposing team able to make the proper adjustments fast enough um, so that they don't lose the game. Yeah, and we can get a little bit more. I mean, the latest I saw on Adrian Martinez is that he's still questionable. I know that um, college doesn't really do the, you know, questionable, doubtful out like the NFL does. But the last I saw, they're going to see if he can run around to practice a little later on today and uh we'll kind of he's not a game time decision but we'll see how he's feeling a little bit later in the week to decide if he can actually go so we we'll get more into the aj martinez and uh k-state matchup in just a little bit but evie mentioned it earlier on in your your passionate um monologue if we will uh spencer sanders was named the big 12 offensive player of the week for the second time this season and jason taylor was the big 12 defensive player of the week for the second time this season um so spencer sanders first he Threw for 391 yards, two touchdowns. This is his seventh 300-yard passing game of his career. He accounted for 434 yards of total offense. Polarizing question, is Spencer Sanders the best player in the Big 12? Guys, there's so much talent around the Big 12 Conference. Like, seriously, who's the best? Who's not the best? I'm no NFL scout. I'm, you know, I'm not able to determine that, but... That guy is a gamer, right? And when I say gamer, I'm spelling the E with a three because that's my guy right there. You, you, you take a look at this guy who, for whatever reason, whenever things don't seem to be going the right way, he knows how to rally the, the troops, right? Um, having a guy who has been a part of the offense so many years, right, it seems like he is so comfortable with that. He's that type of player that you just really want in the foxhole with you because you know that any given play could be that game breaker, right, as a gamer. So I remember Coach Gundy earlier in the season saying that the offense is pretty easy for everybody except for the quarterback. So I think that him having been in this system for so many years in a row now, you're really starting to see him flourish the way that we all knew that he had the ability to and in the way that earned him Gatorade player the year in the state of Texas, right? Because he's able to do it with his legs as well as uh, with his arm. So, hey, maybe not the best player. Who knows? It's not up to me to decide, but probably the most valuable player in the Big 12 Conference. I think that's totally fair, Eve. Um, if you were to ask Spencer Sanders if he thinks he's the best player, he's going to be humble about it. Now He'll say no. He'll probably get the credit somewhere else, maybe where it's even due. Um, but there are, like you said, just a lot of other guys out there, a lot of dudes in the Big 12. Um, I think that Spencer Sanders probably should be considered the best quarterback in the Big 12. Um, not necessarily as a just pure passing uh, touchdown to interception ratio kind of statistics. If you look at that, you got to look at the whole body yeah. of work. Um, so include those rushing yards, include the rushing touchdowns. And then the intangibles. Uh, this guy, I mean, he's got a lot. He's playing hurt. Um, he's oh. just the toughest dude out there. Um, nobody questions his his toughness or his leadership. And um, you know, absolutely, he is one of probably the most valuable player in the Big 12, yeah, especially and just in Oklahoma State. Like to that same point, I think the mobility is, a, is an aspect of football in 2022 that can never be overlooked, right? I think earlier this week, I was watching a Monday night football game between your team, Meg, the Patriots versus the Bears. We're not talking so. about that. We're just going to move on from that <laughs> atrocity. That was so bad. That was but, but you look at one of the defensive masterminds in the league and Bill Belichick, and he was not able to contain to stop uh, Justin Fields, right? Because yes, he's extremely talented, but that mobility is so valuable right now. When you take a look at Spencer Sanders, it really reminds me of how athletic he is. Yeah, he can do it with his arm, but because he has that extra, you know, the X factor, because he has the mobility, it makes it that much more difficult to actually uh, to actually stop him, to actually contain him. So to Justin's point, I really do believe that he is the most talented quarterback in the Big 12 Conference because he has that X factor with his leg. And, and to kind of add on to what you're saying, Eve, like, what we've been saying, I said last week, and like we've said all the previous games, like the success of Oklahoma State is going to be based on how well Spencer Sanders plays. 
And whenever I saw the injury report come out before the game, I saw all these dudes' names for they're out against Texas, like big time players for Oklahoma State. Yeah. But guess who wasn't on that list? Spencer Sanders. And guess what? We won the game. I mean, he the guy is so valuable to Oklahoma State football right now. If he's not in the game, you know, maybe it's more of a coin toss, but the dude is the field general. He's the leader. Everybody gets behind him. They feed off of his energy. And yeah, complete total X factor. No I, just, I think he's matured a lot from last year to this year. I've said it in a previous podcast. I think we won a lot of games in spite of him last year. And this year we're winning games because of him. I think that he has taken, you know, his five year, he's a fifth year senior, but he's, he's learned a lot in those years. He's learned his lessons, some tough, some not, you know, and I think that he has really stepped up as a leader of the offense, which you want your quarterback to be, but he's performing. He's not just talking the talk. He's walking the walk. And I, you know, not that he cares about my opinion, but I'm also like, I'm proud of him. And to have that quarterback, cause last year you're kind of like, I personally was a little bit like, eh, I don't, he's not the guy. And now this year I'm like, he is, he is him, <laughs> you know, yeah, like, no, he's like, that guy. he is a hundred percent that guy. And I think that, you know, he is an asset to this football team and this offense. And I mean, you were saying Eve that in college, there's not that much of a drop off. Well, I think that it in Spencer Sanders case, you know, no shade to Gunnar Gundy, but like there is a drop off because of the intangibles that Spencer yeah. Sanders brings to the offense. But on the other side of the ball really quickly, Jason Taylor, uh, you also said he's a semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe award. He led the Cowboys with nine total tackles, career high, two interceptions. I mean, he, he We've we've talked about the secondary and how they've needed to step up. So Eve, you played you played DB. How are you feeling about them stepping up and you know Jason Taylor's performance against Texas? Yeah, I mean Jason Taylor. First of all, seems like he's always making the big play, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> anywhere is number twenty five. So you know two five live, baby. Hey, we got to represent two five. You weren't the number well, JT. You weren't the number well. Now I will say. Um, the one thing that I was watching for at the beginning of the year with the new defensive coordinator, Derek Mason, is, is the defense all going to be on the same page? And it seems like there is a rally. There's a corral. There is a consistency of, hey, we're going to show up uh, together and we're going to show up in a pissed off mood. And good things happen whenever you all rally to the football every single play. And I think that, you know, Jason really epitomizes that. I don't know if he's the most talented player in the world, but he's going to be the most opportunist, uh, opportunistic player out there because he is always around the football. And what that does for a defense is it lets you know that, okay, maybe at some point, you know, we might bend a little bit, but we're not going to break. And not only are we not going to break, but we're we can make that play at any time that completely changes the momentum and turns it around in our favor. Uh, he he did appear to hurt his knee on his second interception. And I've been trying to scour oh, the yeah. internet for any update and I haven't seen anything, which to me, no news is good news. Have you guys heard anything to the contrary <laughs> that he is hurt worse well, than it might appear? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it looked like a just a hyperextension of his knee, and um, I heard on the post game radio show that he was um, back walking around. Um, I think he might have had crutches, but it sounds like the injury isn't anything that's going to be uh, definitely not season ending. Um, there may be a chance that they want to take it a little easy and rest him up, but. Uh, you know, knowing knowing some of these guys, uh, based on you know what I've what I've seen as far as the discipline and toughness, that. I think he might be in this thing. So uh, I'm not going to count him out until I see his name on that injury report. I love it. Yeah, hopefully he could be the defensive version of Spencer Sanders and be that that tough MF too. <laughs> <laughs> on the subject of injuries. Uh, this weekend we're taking on number 22, Kansas state up in Manhattan, Kansas. And last week we were out without Jaden Bray, Braden Johnson, Preston Williams, Thomas Harper, Brock Martin, and Brendan Evers. But Brendan Evers announced that he was foregoing the rest of the season to focus on the NFL draft. So we will not be with him the rest of the season. Uh, Dom Richardson kind of Irish exited and left, you know, he scores three touchdowns and then just quietly does not play another snap. And I felt like they didn't say anything about that on the broadcast. We talked about Jason Taylor. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> yeah. It was like, what, what is going on? And even still, like I, I looked it up and I just saw like 
left with an injury, but there really wasn't much about it or an injury. So hopefully it was kind of like, okay, you've done your part. Let's get some other guys, some carries, but Eve, how important is it to get some of these guys back this week against Kansas state? But I love that there's nothing uh, out about it, right? Like we don't really know what happened, what's going on here. Just keep it as quiet as possible, right? Keep it strategic. Now, I think it is a huge boost of confidence whenever you go out and you beat a team like Texas last week because, um, you know, after you didn't have so many players that played, right? But of course, it helps. <laughs> it helps so much more whenever you can have all of these players back, right? Um, of course, I'm not over here looking at the the, the tape study. I'm not looking at how uh, we match up against Kansas State, but uh, talent counts for everything. And I know that one thing that uh, is definitely apparent in college sports, it's that nine times out of 10, the team with the, you know, with the horses, right. With the best players tends to win. So, Hey, whatever they're doing over there, I hope the medical staff is taking care of them. The training staff is taking care of them. And also coach glass. Hey, don't let up and hey, make sure that they <laughs> make sure to get out there coach. And we, I mentioned earlier that Adrian Martinez's status is still unclear for Saturday. Justin, how would you, if you're Coach Gundy, how would you prepare for this week not knowing for sure who the quarterback will be? Yeah, I think you have to prepare as if he is going to play. And like I said, we've played against Will Howard in the past, so we've seen, we've got tape on those guys. It's yeah. maybe a little bit different if you're playing a non-conference game. You don't see the same team year after year. But Kansas State, they are who they are. We know who they are. And whether it's Adrian Martinez, whether it's Will Howard, you know, you're going to get pretty much the same thing. So just prepare as if you're going to play Adrian Martinez. Um, you're going to have to show up like you're playing Adrian Martinez. And if Will Howard happens to come in, just know that you're still going to have to show up. You're still going to have to make plays. It might look a little bit different as far as the skill set that he brings to the table, but they're not going to change their offense to fit, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to have time to just completely change their offense to fit what Will Howard's strengths are and uh, give Oklahoma State's defense all kinds of fits. Really, you need to focus on containing um, Deuce Vaughn like you have the last couple of years. They've been able to shut him down um, and a lot of credit is going to go to Jim Knowles for that, but we're starting to see Maybe, you know, some of this can start to go toward Derek Mason for what he's been able to do in second halves of some of these games. So I'm getting pretty hyped about the second half adjustments that he's making and the defense being able to step up. Um, but yeah, I mean, they've got guys all around. So um, they they have a receiver, Knowles, um, that other, um, I'm blanking on his name, I, Warner, I think, number 85. I got to give shout outs to number 85 out there. Um, so it doesn't matter if it's going to be Martinez or Howard in that thing. Uh, defense is going to have to step up and keep making those plays. No weeks off. Eve, Justin, Justin mentioned Deuce Vaughn having big games so far this season. He's had 744 yards and four touchdowns. And we had a hard time slowing down Bijan Robinson in the first half against Texas. So how do you how do you feel about going up against this other pretty solid running back? We've had success in the past, yeah. but you know, last week, do you think that the second half adjustments will carry over into Saturday? Yeah, well, I hope so. I really hope so. I was talking to somebody earlier this week who actually told me that he thinks that Deuce Vaughn is the best running back in the Big 12 and not Bajon Robinson. Ooh. You know, it's kind of, kind of shocking. It was Hot somebody take. who worked. Yeah, somebody who works for the <laughs> Cleveland Browns uh, that that said this. I was like, okay, that's really interesting. But you, t I mean, there's no question that th the dude has a lot of balance, and I think that's the thing that's the most impressive about Deuce Vaughn. Like, it is hard to bring him down, even as as small as he is, right? Like, he is shifty and he stays on his feet. Um, I think with a guy like that, you know, the most important thing is you make sure that he doesn't have the holes to run in, right? Like, if a guy can get away from you know, from your tackles, right? So, some people are just slippery. Like, no matter how much you think you're hanging on to them, mm. you just slip away. And I think that's Andre Sexton, the slipperiest guy I've ever had to block. Yes. Andre, if you're listening, bro, like, what's the deal? Why are you so sweaty all the time? <laughs> bro. Did you call him Slippery Sexton? Because you should have. <laughs> hey, Kendall Hunter, right? Another guy who just 
low center of gravity, yeah. really hard to bring down. And I think that's who Deuce Vaughn really reminds me of. So I think the For key sure. to that is just making sure that you can plug those holes in as soon as possible and not allowing him to get out in open space. And, uh, and yeah, and it's not it's not just the running game, right? Because he can catch the ball, too. Uh, yeah. you, even even with Texas, you saw some the wheel route come out of the backfield um, that B. John Robinson was able to score on. And so it's the same thing for Deuce Vaughn. He can gash you like that. So he's a dynamic player. Um, I don't know if I would say that he's as good as Bijan Robinson. It's probably like 1A, 1B maybe even. But I'll tell you what, man. It's hard for me to be like a fan of somebody on another team, but I'm a fan of Deuce Vaughn. Yes. I don't want him to do great against Oklahoma State. Good luck for the rest of the season. But, man, yeah, he Not just Saturday. seems like a, a, an awesome guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. By all accounts, he's really a good dude, right? So you, you know, you, you kind of root for him, except for whenever he plays your team, you know. So yeah, that's that's uh, that's what I'm going for right here. I know that Mason Cobb this week is probably going to have to get on his horse if he's going to be covering him, especially with those wheel routes and out in the passing game. Guys, last week, last week, uniform predictions were a pretty big hit. So before we get to game picks, I mm -hmm. want to get to uniform predictions. Um, Justin, I'm not going to let you influence my decision because I know you do a lot of research and have your spreadsheets and everything. So I have no That's idea true. what the, what the trends is for the trends are for K state, but I don't think we've seen them yet this season. If we have, I'm just crazy. I'm going to go with the badge logo on a black helmet, white Jersey and orange pants. Okay. I will say that the badge is retired so good luck when Darn it. <laughs> uh I, and i i vaguely remember i don't remember if it was 2019 or 2020 but they kind of laid it to rest very quietly and it was like the guy that was a huge proponent of it was like why are we getting rid of this logo at the time i thought Oh, this is okay. Like I, I'm not going to miss it too much, but now I kind of do. Right. I thought I it was a great badge. Logo, like looking back on it um, because what he said was that it gives symmetry to Oklahoma state's logo. Whereas like, if you, if you notice the brand here, yeah, it's asymmetrical in a way. And so bringing able, being able to make that Marshall star over the, the logo made it symmetrical and, and he really enjoyed that aspect of it. But um, do you want to go for another helmet real quick? Just if you have one off the top of your head that you think it might be, because I, I can guarantee you it won't be the badge, unfortunately. Well, that's just really unfortunate. Um, but off the top of my head, I I would just go with the brand then, the, that, the current uh -huh. OSU brand. I feel like we haven't seen that in a couple weeks and we've gotten fancy. So it's like go back to the basics, but I'm still going to go black helmet, black, black, white, orange. That's exactly what I was going to go with. Black Get out of my head. No, Get so out of my head. I think a big reason why, too, like you have to pay attention to the TV slots like when we're playing. It's a, it's a 2 30 p.m. kickoff, right? Which tends to be in its, it's, in its little slot, right? It's in its mm -hmm. own bucket. So a lot of eyeballs are going to be on that game. And I think that whenever you do get a lot of eyeballs, it's like, okay, let's make sure that because we're away, hey, let's establish ourselves. Hey, this is Oklahoma State. So I like the brand um, because it's consistent across the athletic department. Um, and yeah, white orange. We just we haven't seen it. Great minds, Eve. Great minds. Now here's Justin with his pick that has taken lots of research and data. Well, not a, not a ton. It is kind of interesting. Uh, whenever we played Kansas State, it seemed like we were always going to wear that orange chrome with the giant Pete helmet. That was the trend for a long time. And I think that one has also bit the dust, kind of like what we have with the badge. Um. So I don't think we'll see that one. Now in 2020, we wore all white and we wore the cursive Cowboys yeah. helmet. The only problem is we've already worn that this year at Baylor. And that makes me think we're probably going to go. I'll, I'll say this. I'm looking ahead a little bit, right? Kansas is next week and we usually wear gray against Kansas. Iowa true. state in two weeks. It will be the blackout game. And uh, so we're kind of in a weird spot because we just were all orange. Um, and I think we're probably going to see a white helmet this week. Definitely seeing a white jersey. And then it's just a matter of the pants, I guess. Right. So um, I can get white, go white, one black. For three. I'm sorry. What was that? I interrupted you. Probably. I, I think I would go white, white, black. White, and white. I could. 
I could see it with the Curse of Cowboys again because we wore it in 2020 at Kansas State and won. So there's a little bit of the the good juju you know, right there. In there, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, but we'll see. It's you know, uh, white, white, black. That's not something I don't think we've worn versus Kansas State. So um, it's kind of a kind of a, a weird. We're in a weird spot here. I'm interested to see what the what the equipment managers decide. What Justin decides on this one. Justin Williams, not not you. For those wondering, not you me. don't. He does not decide the uniforms. <laughs> I, but. Uh, sadly, I get no <laughs> uh, no influence on the unofficial on the uniform consultant Justin Southwell in the building. I love it. Really, they hear yeah. this on Thursdays, and then they're like, "That's what we're doing." He has <laughs> no. Justin. Really, has they hear week. it on Thursdays, and they're like, "He guessed it again. Let's change it up." <laughs> love it. And with that, it is time for game picks. Picks with fix. The birthday boy this week, he went with the post. Let's go, Beaks. Come on. Hey, at some point, I'm I'm just not sure if we should be worried or not. All right. He's not been going for us. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. This is a big week for Bix right now. It is. I'm 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 also going to go with the pokes. I'm feeling really good. I think that we're riding a wave. We made second half adjustments. Come from behind win. We're gonna ride this momentum. Yeah. Another big win for the Cowboys. Let's go. All right. I will say before the season started, Kansas State was the dark horse for a lot of people. And it turns out they're right. And a lot of people going through the schedules early on picked Kansas State to win against the Cowboys because it's in Manhattan. Tough place to play. But as it's unfolding, you know I'm going to believe in Oklahoma State. Come on now. So I'm going to go with I'm going to go with Oklahoma State 31, Kansas State 27. Low scoring game for a Big 12 matchup. No, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, I think Vegas has given Oklahoma State like a 54% chance to win. I don't, yeah, I, to me, it's just like seems one and so a half low. point spread right now, I think. Is it really? Yeah, that seems so low, man. My goodness. All right. I have. Uh, the Cowboys have taken it, of course. I really don't think it's going to be close. I think it's going to be like 14 to 44, Oklahoma State. Mm. Yeah. Well, Eve, you're close. You said 38 34 last week, and it was 41. Thir- no. Yeah. You, so you were. You were pretty you were pretty close. I was not. I said it was going to be a blowout. So I hope that you are right again this week and that it will be a blowout. That's four of us, all four of us going for the pokes. So hopefully we all walk away victorious because that means Let's that the go, Cowboys Bix. win. So Bigs come through, Bigs. We need it. <laughs> be nice to him. It's his birthday week. He turns the big two. So okay. We'll be celebrating either way. And with that, we want to thank you for listening to another episode of the Believe in OK State podcast. Once again, I am Megan Robinson, Eve Batoba, Justin Southwell. Thanks for listening to episodes every Thursday. And of course, go Pokes. Go Pokes. Go Pokes. Go pokes.